Espinosa from the Instituto de Estatística Canarias. But before introducing him, let me remember two colleagues from the Spanish Astronomical Society that have died in the last two days. They are Enrique Garcia Berro and Angel Riera. Uh, both of them have been frequent visitors of, the, of our institute. I still remember that Enrique Garcia Berro gave uh, a director's colloquium here about the collision, the collision of, uh, about the origin of the short duration GRBs probably caused by the coalescence of two compact objects. I still remember this seminar that was beautiful. And okay, he was collaborator of, of Jordi Cern and he was visiting the institute for many years. And the second one is Angels Riera. She has died this morning after six years of fighting against cancer. And um, she was also a frequent visitor here. She has uh, good collaborators as Pete Vilches, uh, Martin Guerrero, Luis, um, Guillermo Rada, Luis Miranda, <coughs> but, and I, I was sharing with him, in fact, he has a PhD committee one year ago. It was uh, for the PhD of Kike Macias, and we were having lunch after that. She was healthy at that time. But okay, let me remember them, and okay. <coughs> That's all. I think we, we should remember both persons. Okay, now coming back to science. Uh, as, as mentioned, we have today here uh, Jose Miguel Rodríguez Espinosa. Jose Miguel is, uh, is one of our historic astronomers in Spain, I would say. I have always seen him around the IAA, although the first time we met, I, I was remembering him, it was in a, in a public bus in Bonn. <laughs> <laughs> he was there, I, I was doing my PhD in Germany, and he was asked for a meeting on ISO, ISOFOT. And he was there, and I still remember that in the past there were two persons just talking Spanish, and they were Paco Arazón and Jose Miguel. You can imagine, Jose Miguel, I wouldn't have noticed as he was there. Well, with Paco Arazón, it's impossible <laughs> <laughs> that, that you don't realize that he's around. Okay, Jose Miguel has a, a very international career. He was, he was studying physics in, in Zaragoza with another Spanish astronomer. In fact, I think Juan Uson and John Marcaide were just mates from, from him in the, in the university. He was working there. After that, he moved to, to Madrid for, for a while. No, before that, he, he moved to the University of California San Diego in the US, where, where he got his uh, PhD degree. And then after that, OK, he has been visiting many institutions. He was uh, a postdoc also there in San Diego. He was later uh, an ESO fellow. And he was working there in ESO for many years. And then he came back to Spain as, uh, with the position at the University of uh, Universidad Complutense in Madrid. And from there he moved to, to the IAC, and the IAC has, he has had several different responsibilities. He was uh, uh, the head of the science division for, for some years, and after that also he was the, I remember his position as GPC project scientist. 
But as mentioned, he has been working many th in many different aspects, combining both science and instrumentation. He has um, uh, more than 100 research publications, but besides that, he has been involved in, in instrumentations, as the mentioned isophot on, on both of ISO, also with GTC, okay, many other responsibilities. He has also been collaborating with many con with colleagues from us here in the Institute. He is a member of the Salidos uh, uh, project, if I don't remember badly, and working with Pepe and, and all his team. Um, okay, besides that, science, uh, um, technology, but also he has had the responsi the res other responsibilities. He was the chair of the Spanish Astronomical Society for, for four years. Before that, he was uh, the vice chair. He has been a member of the Spanish delegation in, in the Science Program Committee of ESA. He has also been involved in, in the respective studies about DELSPA, uh, etc. Okay, I, I could be talking for, for many for many minutes, but I, I think that that's enough. But this morning when I was talking to him, what he told me is that he is very happy now because he's back to 100% science, and that's what he's doing just now. And in fact, he's going to, to give us recent results about the hydro ship prot protoclusters with the GPC. Thanks for coming, and we will you. Thank you. For the introduction. When I finished with the GPC, I, I said, at this time, before that, I was working on active galaxies and infrared astronomy, etc. And I said, now I don't know anything about active galaxies nor any other things. So I said, I'm going to do something different. And I start, started studying high redshift sources. And today I'm going to talk about some results that we have obtained recently regarding this, this subject. Essentially, I'm going to talk about protoclasters proto clusters. And they are very good tracers of star formation in the universe, or structure formation, sorry, in the universe, and provide very stringent constraints on some cosmological pa parameters, like sigma 8, the omega matter, and the W, the equation of state. They yield very good information about the, for the the formation and, and the sizes of dark matter halos and provide important, very important constraint on the evolutionary history of over densities that eventually will end up in present day massive clusters. Something that I read yesterday is this paper by Xiang in which he claimed that the fractional volume occupied by protoclustering at high redshift is at least three times, three other magnitudes, sorry, uh, what they occupy now in the present universe. And with that, this is the summary of what I would like to talk. I'm going to introduce you to the to search that we've been doing on the SHARP survey for Lyman Alpha sources. And then I'll talk about the ALBA project, which is a project that we devised to search for the highest redshift galaxies. <coughs> Okay, th this is the work that Pablo Raval, who is a student of mine, has been doing in the past two years. He's been searching for lateral <coughs> sources in the shadow survey, and he has found over uh, 1,200 sources, <coughs> both uh, Lyman alpha emitters and Lyman break galaxies. I don't know how familiar are you with this terminology. In any case, uh, let me mention that Lyman alpha emitters are sources to have a prominent Lyman alpha line, while the Lyman break galaxies only have a continuum, ultraviolet continuum in the rest frame. And therefore, they behave very differently when the universe is neutral. At the very early times when the universe was neutral, it's very difficult to see Lyman alpha emitters because the line is absorbed immediately by the neutral hydrogen but you can see that number of galaxies because the, the ultraviolet continuum can go through the neutral hydrogen. And this is a histogram of, of the sources he has found. 
the, the, the LBGs, they, they are reducing substantially over in redshift. The number of lines, however, is more constant. <coughs> but you, you can see these two peaks. These two peaks are actually two over densities that were known before we, we discovered that. In, in fact, the, the over density at, at Reshi 4 was known by Daddy and, and consists of 12 sources. Pablo has found 20 additional sources around that, in, in that over density. And the one at 5, at 5.2, was discovered in the submillimeter wavelength. By, by Walter Tor in a nature paper. They discovered around 13 sources. Well, Pablo has found 11 of these 13 sources. The two he, he couldn't find were too faint, too, too full of dust, so they were too faint in the optical. But he has found 38 additional sources in this over density. We have already got in time to do a spectroscopy of the, to characterize the, the over density of 5.2 and I have to say that the one at Reggie 4 uh, is still to be confirmed spectroscopically and, that, and there are no plans uh, as of now to, to confirm it. Let me change now to Alba, which is more advanced. And this is a project we started when we were finishing the consolidator grant. The idea there was we would like to detect the highest pressure sources in Africa. And at that time, we were seven people who didn't know anything about high galaxies. <coughs> and then we, we said, OK, there in order to introduce ourselves in the field, let us do, let us explore the environment of two, stras, two star, strong star forming galaxies in the Subaru field that were published by Yoguchi around that time. We said, this is as any other project <coughs> we could envisage to introduce ourselves in the field. At the same time, we had some theory theoretical colleagues in Barcelona, Eduardo Salvador and Alberto Manrique, who were working on the Amiga model. The Amiga model is a, is a semi-analytical model who describes very nicely the universe. And, and, and it's not easy to say that, but let me show you some, some of the graphs. This is the density of coal gas. You see the, the the model is the green line, and the data, uh, the existing data is this. You see how, how well they, they model the, the data. This is the density of matter in stars, the density of black holes. This is the metallicity of the hot gas, the metallicity of the cold <coughs> gas, the metallicity of the stars, the star formation history of the universe. This is the density, I mean, the, the size of the spheroids in the universe. And here you have the density of ionized gas. You see that, well, this is probably not, not as good, but it's in general, it's very good. The, 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 the fit of the model to the, to the observational data. Well, what we did is we knew that Ouchi had published uh, a number of Lyman alpha sources, Lyman alpha emitters, that he said they were in a filament. And we, so we said probably there are many more around those sources that they, that they publish. So we decided to, to take two star 
do very strong star forming services and say, let's see what there is around. So our project consisted of making very deep observation with three filters, three Sharps filters. The Sharps project was ongoing at that moment and, and the filter were open to the community. So we used a filter that was centered on the, at the redshift of the Ochi sources, then one to the blue and one to the red. The idea was that to the blue we, we shouldn't see anything because we have the, the Lyman uh, break immediately after Lyman alpha. And to the red, we could confirm that some of these, those sources were Lyman break because they were some continuum. <coughs> so we, we use very long uh, integration times, you can see here. And the imaging was completed in 2015, more or less. It's, it's already published. This is a student of Rafael Guzman in Florida. This is what we have. <coughs> the, this is the Osiris field. The scene was very good. These are the two sources from Ouchi. And th these are the limits that we reach in the, os in the observation. We, we did the typical color magnitude diagram to, to select the sources, you can see here. And actually the, the data relation was very difficult, very tricky, because the, the sources were very faint. So what we did is we assigned what we did eventually was to assign completed probabilities and probabilities of being spurious to all the sources. And at the end we, we decided, uh, let me show you some of the sources. You see th these are our three filters and these are continuum broadband filters. You can see that some, some of them are easily seen, but some other are more tricky. In, if you go at all of these, you can see that, that, that there is something here in this filter. There is nothing here and nothing here at, at the end. So I imagine how difficult was the data reduction for this. On top of that, we have a very strong gradient in the detector that we couldn't get rid of as, as much as we tried. In any case, at the end, we decided that we have 45 new sources. How real are they? We don't know. But these are the sources. The, the blue, the intense blue ones are priori first priority, and the light blue is second priority. The interesting thing is that we don't see anything in the middle, but we, we think it's because of the strong gradient. I will tell you later that we found, we, we confirmed spectroscopically some of these sources, but also some of these that we thought were actually not reliable. Anyway, anyway even the surface density that you see here, and all of them are in the same ratio because we were limited by the central filter that we used for detecting them. This is a factor of, of two, uh, the number of typical sources in, in a region like, like this. So uh, we applied <coughs> for time to confirm spectroscopically all those sources. We got 40 hours for multi spectroscopy uh, with this, with the highest, I mean, with the reddest. So uh, I think there was the eye, 2,500, sorry. In the 900 nanometer regions, we have already reduced and acquired 24 hours, and 16 hours were done in Asia. Because we got high priority in this project, and, and they, they did that last year, but 
this year, as soon as the field was in, in the sky, they, they finished the project. But we haven't worked this since the laureate yet. As you can imagine, in this region, the skylines are a, a difficult problem. And at the end, we used a combination of visual inspection and an algorithm that is called noise chisel to detect <coughs> the, the sources. And I should, I should use some, some example. So this is the bus we use. Probably you, you cannot see very well, but these are the, this is the, uh, one of the OG sources that we included in the mask just for, con for just to have a contrast with, with something new, with something known. Then we use this chiseling algorithm that essentially what it does is, is a, is a software that goes beyond the noise in, in order to detect something that is synac to noise, noise one or even less than one. What it does is that first we mask all the skylines and, and then we aggregate pixels that are contiguous. For example, like this one or this or this. And then by visual inspection, we, we decide which one it will be the source. For instance, this one is the one of the OG sources. This is very, very easy to see. You, you, you have here the typical profile of a, of a Lyman alpha source, of, a, of the line, of Lyman alpha line, which is asymmetrical because of absorption to the blue of the, of the line. And these are some of the sources that we have detected, and I'll show you the spectra in a minute. Recently, we have also detected some of these, but I don't have the, the name written in the, in the new graph. These are some of the sources. You, you, you may see that they are practically equal to the noise, but you see that they are free from skyline. This is the, the sky. And when you see strong lines, it's because of the lines, the skylines. So, and, and this is kind of asymmetric. This one, similarly, is also free of skylines that introduce a lot of noise. Here, there, you see one. Just this one, you can see the in the in the plot that there is a blob somehow. And these are typical fluxes for, for that type of sources. They, they are very very thin, and that's formation that are even lower than our galaxy. And people claim that these type of sources are the one that really analyze the universe. But the only thing you can think of is <coughs> that you have to have lots of those sources to produce the number of ionizing photons capable of really ionizing the universe. <coughs> So, as I said, the, the data reduction was very difficult, very low signal to noise, but that what we can do with GTC and series, I think. Last week I was in, in Madrid in, in a Megara um, a workshop, and I made a, a calculation with their exposure time calculator, I, and probably mm -hmm. with Megara we could do much better. This is this is a, a, a line that is five times 10 to the minus 19 hertz per second per centimeter square, and with a continuum which is of that order also. And probably you can see that with, with double the resolution of a size and much more sensitivity. So probably this, this should be better in the future. In any case, since we think we have confirmed some of the sources, 
spectroscopically, we have built a luminosity function. And what we have done is, we have <coughs> done only for the left part of the field. Remember the left part where the, one of the Uchi sources was? And then, the, uh, excuse me, the full field, and then the left part of it. Because it gives us much better confidence than the, the full field. In any case, these are the parameters of the luminosity functions. Probably you cannot see them, but I I go through, uh, through them in a minute. The two lum luminosity functions are very similar, uh, as they should be. Here we have much less object, and therefore uh, is less certain. But this one is very certain. And this is the OG, the OG luminosity function. As you can see, we have many more <coughs> objects. Um, for that reason, is the number of sources is larger. So now we, we can do something, I mean, a study to, to see how that over density is going to evolve. And what we do is we consider our phi parameter, and the phi parameter is the one is the one that essentially tells you the density of sources. If you compare our density of sources, this is the, the full field with the with the parameter, the same parameter for Uchi. That is more or less as in the large scale we could say this is more or less equal to the density of sources divided by the overall density of sources in the universe, of Lyman alpha sources in the universe, okay? And, and this ratio is 1.53. So people define a density contrast, which is this number minus one, and that would be the density contrast. Now, we can use, the, this is the density of Lyman alpha sources in the universe. This is a value that is known we can use this ratio to determine the density of sources in our field. Essentially, is this the density of sources in the universe time of 0 0.53. And this is the density that we have. <coughs> Since we know that the volume that we have observed, which is essentially the, the surface times the, the, the depth of the filter, then we can calculate the mass of the overdensity, which is, as you can see here, is almost three times 10 to the 14 at this ratio. Okay? And then we can follow the, that evolution, assuming that we are in the linear perturbation regime. So essentially, the dark matter halo grows uh, linearly with time. And this is what the, essentially what this tells you. These are the linear perturbation <coughs> growth factors. Uh, and you have here that the density, uh, the linear perturbation growth factor at the ratio of collapse divided by the, red, the, the linear perturbation growth factor at 6.5, which is our ratio, should be similar to the density at this ratio of collapse divided by the density 6.5. And from this, essentially, we determine that this overdensity is going to collapse at a ratio of 2. And if, if you assume that there are no major measures, the mass of the corresponding halo uh, locally would be 2.6 10 to the 15 solar masses. And this is similar to comma at this time. So this is a, an overdensity that is going to evolve eventually and become as large a comma a redshift zero. What if we do not believe the right part of, <coughs> of the field? In that case, we are in a bigger problem because the density contrast is 
1.85. For deltas above 0.69, we are no longer in the linear regime. And that means that we enter in a scenario in which you have elliptical collapse. And that implies that that over density is already collapsing at that very early time in the universe. And this probably the people doing theory are not very happy with. As I told you before, we are trying to, to observe very high redshift galaxies. And what I mentioned so far is redshift 6.5. So, when Silstre arrived to the GTC, we ordered a, a custom-made filter that was centered at 9.3, a range 9.3. So essentially, Lyman Alpha at 9.3 should go through this filter in, in the Silstre universe. That would be around <coughs> in the J-band, essentially, in the infrared. CIRSA is a near-infrared <coughs> visiting instrument from the University of Florida, and which is now installed at, at the GTC with our filter. Jesus Gallego, who is the PI of this project, got 23 hours with CIRSA, and the data is still being processed. Mm, only five hours has been gone into this, and here you can see this is a, 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 a HST image of this field. This is the ages field. And you can see that some of these sources, you can detect them already. And there is this one also, which is one here. But this is only five hours. There is a student that is working to complete the 23 hours that they, they have been several already, but they have, they have not been processed. And we hope that when we have all the time, we may see some Lyman alpha emitters at, at the range of 9. Which is the declination of Fibis field? Which is the declination of Fibis field? The ages? The declination for this field. I don't even remember. This is equal to This one is equal our our the future essentially one one of the things that our theoretician friends propose is that that model that is reproducing a lot of the observing observation in the that are of many different parameters in the universe is better uh, fit with a double reorganization scenario. It's not incompatible with a single reorganization scenario, but it's better fit with a double reorganization scenario. This would mean that essentially this uh, the population three stars would achieve a full realization of the universe around C10. And then, since they would decay, the universe would be almost become neutral again, and then the galaxies would complete the realization by redshift 6 or more or less. So, uh, JWST is trying indeed to, de to find sources at, at redshift 10 or so. But how are they going to do that? Essentially, they don't know where to look, and the field of JWST is very small. So our idea, our idea is to, to build a microsatellite, a dedicated microsatellite. The advantage of that is that we have a large field. So this is ideal for blind searches. And the idea would be to have a filter 
tuned to resist pain or close dedicated to, to the project and, that, and, and in that case you know, the integration time is not a problem because we could be one or two years integrating and it would be relatively inexpensive in fact uh, we have been talking with Satlantis but Satlantis what, it has a double telescope with a 19 centimeter each one and probably that doesn't reach as deep as we would like to get but there is the possibility of making instead of a binocular telescope making a single telescope with a 30 centimeter mirror and probably that would be valid for us for, for detecting these this Lyman alpha sources and testing the double realization scenario for the universe and this is our best option today for detecting those theta, theta n sources and that is essentially what I wanted to to tell you today this is a summary that I'm not going to repeat because it's essentially <laughs> what I but I already told you. And the last part. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll have time for some questions. Uh, um, um, bueno, los flujos que habéis detectado realmente es impresionante ¿no? que, sea, que, que seamos capaces de detectar de esas fuentes tan, tan débiles ¿no? pero yo me pregunto también cuánto eh, si habéis hecho algún tipo de corrección por, o bien por absorción estelar o bien por la propia absorción del medio de interestelar porque como tú has mostrado por una parte tenemos eh, seguramente estos objetos, las poblaciones estelares son relativamente jóvenes y tienen unos estables en las que pueden tener un ofro en los que están absorbiendo parte del ala azul de la línea de Limán Alfa. Con lo cual, eh, teniendo en cuenta que la señal mm, sobre el con, supuesto continuo de, de la galaxia eh, es relativamente débil, el que tengas ahí una, absorbido parte de la línea, el, el ala azul, pues eh, tiene que hacer una diferencia importante en cuanto al flujo y en consecuencia en cuanto a esta formación red. Y lo mismo también en cuanto a la población estelar. Si son estables jóvenes, pues pueden tener, bueno, las poblaciones pues menos de un gigante con toda seguridad y ahí eh, por lo menos en los cálculos que, y las predicciones que se hicieron hace ya más de 20 años al modelar este tipo de líneas se prevé que también exista una sección de dos o tres actos que teniendo en cuenta la debilidad de, del continuo puede ser... Lleva razón en todo lo que dice. De hecho, estas fuentes, las que tienen líneas de visión son muy muy jóvenes. Son menos, si no recuerdo bien, menos de 15 millones de años. Porque en 15 millones de años ya desaparece la, la línea Lima Alfa y, está, y empieza a aparecer un continuo. Entonces, nosotros no hemos hecho esa corrección que tú dices. Esencialmente porque no sabemos cómo hacerla, no sabemos cuánta ni extinción tenemos hacia, la, hacia las fuentes. Interna no van a tener mucha porque eso, pero efectivamente la línea sí está absorbida. Y, y no tenemos forma de saber más que quizá construir la, la simétrica, pero, sí. pero no lo hemos hecho. Sí, pero eso a lo mejor te puede dar una idea, porque claro, los ritmos de formación estelar ya son límites inferiores a los reales. Claro. Y entonces eso, ¿cómo te puede afectar a la hora de construir la función de luminosidad? Pues puede, puede afectar de forma importante, ¿no? Sí, I have a question. I, I don't know if you explained it and I didn't understand it properly. But you mentioned that there was a gradient in the images that you could not get rid of. No. Uh, what kind of gradient are you talking about? It, it's, just it's a gradient in the in the in the CCD image. Th that is because of the filters being at an angle. Yeah. Right. So you also have different filter 
at different parts of the of the image because the, the response function is also angle dependent. That was a problem of the of the angle filters like Osiris has. Yeah. So uh, and and the, that, that is I mean, you said you could not get rid of in the sense that you cannot account for it. Yeah. Or we could not. I mean, I, I didn't work on that. Yeah. It was that that student of Rafael Goodman in Florida. Yeah, sorry. And uh, essentially, at the end, we ended up assigning probabilities of being spurious to every to, to different sources or probability of being uh, complete. Yeah. It can be modeled. But yeah, but yeah, it's, I, I imagine it's, that it's, uh, it's sometimes you introduce more noise. Yeah. Essentially, what we did, we, we built the inverse to to find how many source, spurious sources we could have in the field okay. when, when you multiply the minus one. And then uh, the number of sources that we had, we related them to the, to the average spuriousness. Yeah. That's field. something that, that happens with all the filters in Osiris. Yeah. But of course, with narrow filters, it's much more, it's much more difficult. Thanks. Oui. Yeah, so uh, I'm totally a meek way guy, so I don't do anything about the uh, high ratio galaxy. So I want to ask some naive questions. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you get a spectral, you see a strong emission lines. So, how do you know it's lemma alpha or H alpha or something else? <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I just naive question. <laughs> yeah, let, let, me, let me answer that. Essentially, we, we have a filter that is tuned to, to light and alpha. Mm -hmm. But, of course, you could get oxygen-3 or uh, H-beta, H-alpha, etc. Yeah. Et but, uh, in case it would be any of those interlopes, we call them, uh, you, could, you could see the continuum mm -hmm. in some other filter, broadband filter, mm -hmm. that is in the literature. For example, with HST, these fields are um, have been observed with very long iteration time. So anything that that would be seen in oxygen two or or oxygen three or H alpha, you could you can see it in the in HST images. You so mean some image in the short wavelength? Yes. yes. So. So we will get rid of those. Okay. okay. So you still need to use other observation to exclude. Uh, of course. Yeah. Okay. The second question is that you, if you go to see the spectrum, right? You see the lines asymmetric, right? Mm -hmm. Asymmetric. So uh, from tuition, I guess it's because absorbed by local, uh, local molecular color in the galaxies. So cause this kind of asymmetric shape. Is that correct? Yeah. No, it's, it's absorption in the in the system of the of the galaxy. In the system of galaxy, yeah, yeah. in the local, just uh, I mean local is the local in the galaxy. Yeah. So then, because of the shape has changed, right? Because of absorption. So how can you use this line to determine the rate shift? Because of the, because uh, intrinsically it's uh, like a Gaussian shape, right? But some absorption you cut some part. Now, how do you use the determine the rate shift from the lines? Yeah. Yeah, you can see that that the line, this line, is not in the middle of the line. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's so somehow ap approximately set where we think the center of the line would be if we were symmetric, and that's how we determine the rate shift. So you still use the center to determine the shape? Yes. Because of the shape, in the shape of the line, you look like it's the line because of absorption, you cut some part. Now probably the central already is not an intrinsic center of the line, right? Because of the absorption. Yeah, that's what I think. Change, the, right? change the shape. I mean, if you would put this line on the center of the, it would be like right here. But we somehow are estimating the, the, the center. As if the line was in it. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the change in the, in the resin will be relatively mm -hmm. small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, in any case, mm -hmm. it could not be too much. You think it's okay? I think it's Martin. Mm -hmm. okay.
Enrique, yo ahora sí, ya, es que es mi. Sí. Ah, uh, es congratulations. Um, I, I was wondering about the other UV lines in the REST frame, uh, including carbon-3, carbon-4, oxygen-3. These lines are very useful to know things about, for instance, ionization mm -hmm. parameter, metal content, the nature of the ionizing stars, uh, if they are AGN or not. So do you plan to make some spectroscopic follow-up in the near infrared to try to know these things at the reset? This would be great. Yes. Yeah. But this also not very extremely thing. It's very difficult to do that. There is there is data, for instance, there is a source that is called CR7, in which it's a very it's a it's a very bright gamma alpha source. And it has been observed spectroscopically and you and you can see carbon four, carbon three, the semi-for line, etc. Uh, that, that is something I have to know. What we are trying to do is to observe this in the sub millimeter, mm -hmm. carbon two in the sub millimeter. Mm -hmm. But that's something we, we have applied for time, but we don't have any result. Did you get the time? Pardon? <laughs> Did you get the time for sub millimeter? No, no, no. We haven't yet. <laughs> <laughs> Martin. Um, Thanks very much for your interesting uh, piece of science that you're doing here. Yeah. I have a question as for the IG's uh, mm, observation. You mentioned that you're going to observe in the near infrared using one filter on the uh, in and alpha line so to, to see that mental tree. Is that one single filter on the line? Are you using yeah. all filters? With yeah, but, which from but the, the I mean the point is that for AGs, there are HST observations okay. in the J-band, mm -hmm. with the broadband J-band. So essentially, we compare our observation in the narrow filter with the broadband filter. So you expect to see those in the narrow band filter, yes. but not in the HST mm -hmm. broadband filter? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I just, excuse me, my ignorance, because I'm mm -hmm. how, how do you know that? That's an object because what I'm seeing just noise. <laughs> 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 I, I don't know. I, I don't have an answer. I mean, you can guess. Yes. <laughs> Essentially, I mean, we've been. There is some division in the HST use too. We have been using, in fact, the, the person who developed this, this software is an Iranian postdoc who is working in Lyon in France, and we invited him to come to, to the IEC to help us making making sense of this data. Essentially, I mean, you, you could say this is a, a possible source here, but also there is here, there is here, or, or here, or here. And then you go to the, to the sources, and you see that there is a blob here. But these many blobs probably is, is a line this is a spectrum of the skyline, of the, the, the sky. These are probably due to, to the sky, to many, many lines in the sky, and these too. So this is, uh, and this is not a good example because it's very close <laughs> again to the sky, but it looks a bit asymmetric. But let me, this one here, you see, you could say this is the line. No, but this is probably a skyline, <coughs> a bad sub subtraction of the skyline. So probably this, this is much better option, or this one, which is free of skylines. Yeah, but what I mean when I, when I say that I'm seeing, I'm seeing just noise is that I, for me, that peak is equally 
probable as the other one that it is to the left or to the right or even to the right. Yeah, this one, right? <laughs> but this is not symmetric in the right sense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that because I've been working with Osiris more, more so data, and I know that it's completely hell to try to get rid of the sky if you don't make very precise, uh, specific things just to take that into account. And also the pipeline is quite crazy. So, I mean, mm, um, that's what I'm asking. Mm -hmm. This is the best we can do with it. you have HST observation mm -hmm. on this guy? Do you have HST observation? Yeah, but HST that doesn't know that has different things. OK. Do you, uh, you see in the optical band or in the uh, near infrared? The HST? Optical and near infrared. Uh, now I think probably this guy will show up in the near infrared band, right? Sorry? Uh, this guy uh, should show up in the near infrared band, right? Because you can see it in uh, lemma upper, and they'll probably show up in the near infrared. So you say that it's shadow, the image is shadow, not deep enough. So you probably show up in the near infrared band. Yeah, but it's not visible. Yeah, 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 it's not visible. Mm -hmm. And you don't see anything. You see, here we see le Lehman Alpha, yeah. and you mm -hmm. don't see anything there. Okay. But for the two long wavelengths, you can see something there, right? And uh, uh, the the right there is nothing is here. Not? There is nothing here. Uh, we have also searched in, in some of the near infrared bands. Yeah. The Probably the using the chemistry. But we haven't seen anything there. It's still working. Miguel, would provide so that uh, maybe we can improve a bit uh, to the detection in, in the sense that Isabella yeah. pointed out that the, the noise is yeah. so so I, I also I mean I and, and also I would like to know if uh, you have tried to do observations of these sources with ALMA <coughs> and try to detect sound uh, well, because I, I don't know if this, uh, I just suspect this, these are quasar or, or they are uh, transforming object or something. And um, if you plan to do something with Alma, yeah, we have a and life try to, to do with some Alma other time. lines, it will give uh, really a better answer to this. Yeah, we have a plan for We need some to look for carbon. Yes. It is a very young galaxy, you are not going to show that they are not going to show emission. Yes, carbon plus. Carbon plus. Carbon plus. Yes. Yes. That, that is still to be I mean, I expect that to be quite tricky to even in Alma. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's going to be not easy. Mm -hmm. yeah, but there are some, so some, some sources mm -hmm. lighter than this have been detected in carbon. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you relate the, your results of the redshift and the over density and with the first models of the amila that you showed before? Mm -hmm. How do you relate it? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and in fact, the number of mm, product clusters at that redshift is limited mm -hmm. according to models. And so there should be, uh, I don't remember, uh, five or six at most. We have received larger than two. And we have seen three already. This one, the alpha one, the, the one of received four, and the one of received five. So there, are, there should be also only three other mm -hmm. somewhere else. Excuse me. If you do any analysis on the slope of the velocity function that you obtain, it's rather high. I mean, when you get something like 1.5, something like that, those are for, uh, for clusters. Not yeah. for the field. The the alpha parameter, yeah. the slope, uh, we have used the same as a key, just 
in order to, to compare similar things. And we, that's something we didn't have any clue as to which one we use. Okay, any, any final question? Just a curiosity. Just uh, the microsatellite is a wishful thinking or is <laughs> it a real project? <laughs> no, it's a we are working. Yeah? I mean, with a lot of interest in that. <laughs> <laughs> How much would that cost? Yeah, that's a, that's a second question. Including launch, yeah. less than 10 million euros. Less than 10 million? Could you buy for that money lots of observing time or a big telescope? <laughs> 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 if you compare that with JWST, which is probably yes. 1,000 million or more. Okay. This is an Spanish project or mm -hmm. with some partner? No, there is a company which is in the Basque country, that is called Satlantis. That is, actually, they are launching the first satellite in a couple of years. And they want to offer the first satellite to scientists. Mm -hmm. Like Cristina Armendi has done it for the best now. Is there any such project? Don't you plan to get Isa money? Or? In a meeting we had in Tenerife a few years ago, the uh, European Astronomical Service, I think, I asked Alvaro Jimenez whether they were interested in microsatellite, he said no. <laughs> <laughs> NASA is interested, and NASA is kind of uh, micro satellite. Not micro, my mini. Mini Okay, thanks, Jose Miguel, for this very interesting talk. And <laughs>